Please remain standing and remove your caps for the singing of our national anthem. From Bush Stadium in downtown St. Louis, welcome to Cardinals baseball as the Cardinals play the second game of a four-game series against the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Dod St. Louis is a baseball town. Smith, court 20 to right, down the line. With a long history of epic victories. But on May 26, 1780, the site of this ball field was the center of a battlefield. And what took place in St. Louis that afternoon reshaped the future of the city and possibly the entire American West. And it all happened in less time than it takes to play a baseball game. Well, I think most people, when you first say the Battle of St. Louis, think it must have been an American Civil War battle. They come up to me afterwards and say, I never heard of this before. Probably one of the most significant and underrated battles of the entire American Revolution. It was the first of only two Revolutionary War battles fought west of the Mississippi, with a legacy that has rippled across two and a half centuries of American history. The Battle of St. Louis is one of the reasons why Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan are now part of the United States rather than Canada. People just don't know about it. And then when they hear about it, they refuse to believe it. Certainly never learned about it in school and went to school here in St. Louis, grade school and high school and college. Never remember hearing about it at any of that. The vast majority of the books written about the American Revolution are written by authors Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Maryland, Virginia. Gee, I see a pattern there. It's East Coast snobbery. In St. Louis, a few reminders of the battle still exist, but not many. The only genuine relic that survives is the church bell used to warn the town it was coming under attack. For a long time, the story of the battle itself was under attack. In the late 19th century, there were historians who denied that it had ever happened. And then the evidence turned up that, it, in fact, it had happened, and it turned out to be a much bigger story than anybody had anticipated. Now, a pair of history detectives is trying to fill in the rest of the blanks, looking for clues buried in ancient documents written in three languages, hidden on two continents. It's a completely different set of stories that are just fascinating and that we're still learning about. The attack on St. Louis was led by the British, but they recruited Native Americans to do most of the fighting. They knew they had to pick a side. Some of it was trying to make calculated decisions in a way that wouldn't get too many of them killed. The Battle of St. Louis is a story of keen foresight, vainglorious mistakes, redemption, high hopes, and false hopes. You have this group that's in bondage. They're listening to this. Liberty, freedom, it sounds really great. I want that too. The St. Louisans who came under attack that day were outnumbered three to one but a surprise, thunderous defense led to their unlikely victory. Oh, say can you see? If St. Louis's ragtag militia had lost the fight at this spot on that day, today, these St. Louisans might be standing for the singing of God Save the Queen at a cricket match instead of a baseball game. Between St. Louis and Los Angeles, the visiting team from Mexico. If the British had won the battle at St. Louis, the world would be a different place. Had St. Louis fallen, maybe we'd still be having tea at four o'clock with our pinky in the air.
Five years after the start of the Revolutionary War, St. Louis was a trading post, one mile long, three blocks deep, and out in the middle of nowhere. Rowdy and raw, with all the maturity of a teenager. And it made sense. In 1780, St. Louis was only 16 years old. People in the late 1700s in St. Louis were very poorly behaved. The world, the flesh, and the devil. It was a quote in an official document from the time, correspondence, describing the behavior of the people in St. Louis. The world, the flesh, and the devil being a reflection on people being too much consumed by the things of the world. St. Louisans were fond of bar hopping and bed hopping. Gambling was plentiful. Food was not earning the town a mocking nickname, Pan Cour, French for short of bread, and it usually was. In 1780, most St. Louisans preferred selling things to growing things because it paid better, especially the fur trade. The official population of St. Louis was around 700, but in 1780, most everything else about St. Louis was highly unofficial. You see a similar phenomenon in a lot of early colonial settlements, that the institutions that regulate people's behavior, the church and the state, schools are in their infancy. And anyone who comes from outside and tries to impose new regulations or new behaviors gets a fair amount of pushback. St. Louis was founded by French families, named for a French king, and built at the edge of the French colony of Louisiana. But just as the town was being planned and settled, back in Europe, the French, who had just lost a war, were in the process of transferring ownership of Louisiana to the King of Spain. St. Louis was multilingual, it was multicultural, it was multiracial, and it was multiethnic. Roughly one-third of St. Louis's residents were black. Some were free, most were enslaved. You cannot have the development of Upper Louisiana that's gonna eventually become Missouri without blacks, period. They are a part of the foundation. Its timber homes were primitive, but St. Louis's location made the town more valuable than the sum of its parts. They built it on a limestone bluff next to the Mississippi River, just 15 miles from its confluence with the Missouri River, the most profitable trade route in the West. The rivers are the expressways of the day, and that's where all commerce, economics, money was traveling, and you had to control that. With St. Louisans barely able to control themselves, they had paid little attention to who controlled the Mississippi but the British were starting to give it their attention. And then on a spring day in 1780, a woman in a canoe got St. Louis's attention, coming to town with a warning that forced the village to sober up fast. You see, we've got Spanish pistol. I was a young boy. My uh, mother remarried and was starting another family, so she would take me on Saturdays to the library and leave me there all day. And I had a chance to explore on my own and came across a book called The Sword Does Not Jest. It was the true story of a young military hero, and reading it inspired what would become Steve Kling's lifelong devotion to studying military history a pursuit encouraged by his father, a military school graduate who served as an officer during the Korean War. But Kling's intense curiosity about the Battle of St. Louis came from his mother's side of the family, a long line of ancestors named Rubidoux, stretching back to Joseph Rubidoux III, a member of St. Louis's militia at the time of the battle. Inspired by that connection, Kling would spend the next 25 years collecting everything he could find about a battle hardly anyone in his hometown of St. Louis knew anything about. But long after his quest for answers began, Kling heard about someone else with a similar interest in the Battle of St. Louis. Only her investigation was happening a long way from St. Louis.
The General Archives of the Indies is located in Seville, which is close to where I live. It's a beautiful building, and I can sit for five hours without realizing I'd been there for five hours. And when I get up, I thought it was two, so I lose myself in it. Christine Schostrom is an American, but in college, her love of European culture led her to study in Spain, where she fell in love with a man from Spain. In 1989, they married. She has lived there ever since. Like Steve Kling, Christine Schostrom had been investigating family connections to the American Revolution. And that's how she met historian Ken Karstens, who posed a question to Schostrom that would lead her research in a new direction. When he found that I lived in Spain, he said, so what do they think in Spain about Fernando de Leyva? And I said, who? He said, well, they, he must be a hero over there. And I said, who? <laughs> Fernando de Leyva was an officer in the Spanish army. And when Schostrom realized hardly anyone in Spain knew who he was, she started digging for information at the Spanish archives in Seville. Among the 80 million documents in the archives, Schostrom found more than 100 related to Captain Fernando de Leyva the man she'd never heard of, who turned out to be the tarnished hero of a battle she'd never heard of. The Battle of St. Louis. I often come across letters that no one else has ever discovered or cited before. And even if it's a little detail, I'll go home and I'll tell my husband, oh my gosh, I just found out the name of Fernando de Leyva's second child, or, you know, and that's exciting. It makes it real and more human. Eventually, Schostrom and Kling found each other and in 2016 began working together, seven time zones apart. It's a challenge sometimes. You might find a document and you want to read it and you can't or you have to struggle at it. You can spend several hours trying just to decipher that document and it's worth it. The American Revolution in the East is a fairly simple story. It's the British against the Americans. In the West, it was a five-sided conflict. The Battle of St. Louis is the only battle that I can think of that took place in the West where all five sides were there. Two of the five sides were the British and the Spanish. At the time of the Battle of St. Louis, England owned everything east of the Mississippi. Spain owned most everything west of the Mississippi. And it was a precarious arrangement because the Spanish and the British hated each other. So it was no surprise when the Spanish, with help from the French, who also hated the British, began sneaking weapons up the Mississippi River to the Americans, who were at war with the British. The smuggling operation was not much of a secret, but for a long time, the British ignored it. They didn't want to draw Spain into the war. I mean, if they start attacking the ships and taking the cargoes, that's a provocation for war. And um, they were hoping that neither France nor Spain would get into the war and let them deal with their colonies. But France and Spain eventually did enter the war, making it clear to the British it was time they took control of the entire Mississippi River Valley. The British were very interested in the Mississippi Valley. They wanted to attack the American forces from the west. But to the British, capturing St. Louis was about more than just defeating George Washington. Tell us what you got on your mind, George. I didn't come this far to get chased off at the first smell of a chance to fight the British. Can we do it, George? I grew up knowing all about George Rogers Clark. You ask a school child today and they have no idea who he is. You can count on me to come along, George. George Rogers Clark was one of 10 children. He was the second child. I want Hamilton in chains in Virginia. Maybe because he played second fiddle to an older brother, he developed an A-style personality where I can do, look at me, not just my older brother. And that carried him through his career. I say we treat those British to an early spring. George Rogers Clark was from Virginia, the largest of the 13 original American colonies. By the 1770s, fertile land in Virginia was getting harder to find, 
So in 1771, at the age of just 19, Clark began a series of trips west to find new places for pioneering Virginians to settle. He was the second son. If he was to ever find any land of his own, he had to go west of those mountains. And that's what he did. Legally, the land west of Virginia belonged to England. And the British tried hard to keep it that way, recruiting local Indians to attack the Americans claiming British land in a territory known as Kentucky. Clark raised a militia and fought back against the Indian attacks so successfully. In 1778, Virginia Governor Patrick Henry sent Clark and his men on a secret mission to seize even more British land west of Kentucky in what today is southern Indiana and southern Illinois, known then as the Illinois country. Clark and his men marched across the wilderness, capturing British outposts as far west as the Mississippi. One of them was a village just across the river from St. Louis called Cahokia. And it was there that Clark gathered Indians from all across the region to deliver an ultimatum. As he spoke, Clark held a wampum belt in each hand. One for war, one for peace. Now here he is with about 30 or 40 of his men and hundreds of Indians. Which one you want? You want to go to war? I'm a warrior. Take the one for war or you can sue for peace. The Indians chose peace because they knew how George Rogers Clark made war. Clark, he fought like us. It's like having another tiger in the woods when you're the tiger. For a while, the fear Native Americans had of George Rogers Clark kept the peace between them. But the British also feared Clark, and they chose war, which suddenly made St. Louis an important target. St. Louis was an irritant to the British because they were supplying George Rogers Clark's men with the munitions and uniform cloth, things they needed to maintain a presence in the Illinois country. The British, they were bound to want at some point to respond to George Rogers Clark and reclaim that land. And this was the moment. Three weeks before George Rogers Clark conquered Cahokia, St. Louis was also coming under new management. Fernando de Leyva was a Spanish infantry officer. He actually had been born into a family that had a long military tradition. Captain Fernando de Leyva was sent by the governor of Louisiana, whose headquarters were in New Orleans, to serve as lieutenant governor for Upper Louisiana which was headquartered in St. Louis. Leba took up the position in the summer of 1778, two years before the British attack. He was in charge of all the governmental and administrative functions. He served as the judge. He made the militia list. He did all the normal duties of a, of a local governor. Fernando de Leba was an autocratic soldier and a melancholy man. Most St. Louisans disliked him, and the feeling was mutual. He was very standoffish and difficult to approach. I think he felt that his obligation was towards his superiors and towards his king. They just didn't get along with him. I think he was aloof. He was very uh, by the book. The people here were not by the book. The people of St. Louis accused DeLeba of the most base concupiscence and debauchery. They thought he was embezzling. They thought he was immoral. And he thought the same of them. He just had a terrible time in St. Louis, and then he fell ill. He was so ill, he couldn't even write his own letters. He had someone else write his letters for him, and that's why those letters are in French and they're not in Spanish. The nature of Leba's illness is only one of several mysteries about his life. We have no idea what he looked like. We don't know if he was fair or dark or tall or short, because no portrait has ever been found of him or any of his family members either. And believe me, I've been looking, but I'll find out. For a long time, it had been assumed Leba was from Barcelona until Christine Schostrom found his baptism records at a Spanish church revealing Leba was born in Sota. 
a fortified Spanish enclave on the northern coast of Africa. I think that the news that he was born there was new to just about everybody. And what's interesting is that Ceuta is a military community. A list of Leyba's household possessions suggests he came to St. Louis with his personal finances in order. But that would change after Leyba was told to start supplying his neighbor across the river, George Rogers Clark. De Leyva had an order from New Orleans that had told him that he should cooperate with the Americans. He took cooperation to new and wonderful levels by supplying them with nearly all their needs and wants. Leyva presented St. Louis merchants with the long list of supplies Clark needed, and they were not happy about it because they were going to be paid with currency good only in Virginia. So Leyva used his own credit to make sure the merchants got paid. It left him deeply in debt. But Leba was worried more about a different kind of deficit. St. Louis was almost entirely undefended when he arrived in 1778. St. Louis didn't think it needed to defend itself. They thought they were friends with everybody. But Leba was convinced St. Louis would eventually be attacked by the British. So we wrote to Governor Bernardo de Galvez, asking for more soldiers, twice. The letters are very formal and, you know, they end up by, uh, you know, I kiss your hand and most, uh, your most obedient servant kind of stuff. Uh, but Galvez couldn't do much to help Leyva, or didn't do much. Leyva has to really rally people to support him to get some sort of defensive works in place. In early 1780, many St. Louisans dismissed rumors the village was going to be attacked by the British. But then Magdalene Honoré came to town. The Honoré family ran a trading post north of St. Louis. And when Indian traders told them the British were planning a series of attacks up and down the Mississippi Valley, Magdalene Honoré left her husband and sons behind and paddled a canoe 60 miles south by herself to warn Fernando de Leyva. Once they got the word that the British were on the way, there was a very serious set of discussions about what to do. Uh, and not everyone necessarily agreed what to do. But ultimately, it was the Lieutenant Governor's decision, and he decided that St. Louis would build defenses. Without reinforcements coming from New Orleans, Leyva had no choice but to come up with a new way for St. Louis to defend itself and once again, it would cost him deeply. Although British soldiers were winning battles in the east, their commanders were exasperated by continually being undermined in the west. They had tolerated Spain using the Mississippi to send weapons to the Americans. They had even put up with George Rogers Clark brazenly grabbing land in the Illinois country. But in 1779, when Spain decided to openly enter the war, it was more than the British could bear. But it was also more than the British could handle alone. They had very few troops out west. They didn't have an army of occupation. They were too thinly spread and it was incredibly difficult to supply them in the uh, Midwest. The grand plan is my turn. The grand plan was formulated by Lord George Germain and he was the de facto commander-in-chief uh, for North America and as soon as Spain entered the war he sent out a series of orders which started the grand plan in motion. The British grand plan called for capturing towns on both sides of the Mississippi River, attacking from the north and the south. But to cover that much ground, the British knew they had to seek help from people they didn't like and didn't trust. The British were not keen on using Native American troops. I mean, if there's one fault with the British Army, uh, and it's one that we continue to have to this day, and that's professional hubris. They believed in themselves and people who'd gone through the same training and had very little time for what they regarded as amateurs. 
the English thought that they could send a force that included large numbers of Indians to St. Louis to attack it successfully, because they saw St. Louis as a place that was open to Indians, accessible and welcoming to Indians, so that Indians might be able to be making their way towards St. Louis without being suspect. We are so That battle was in our neighborhood and within our territory because our territory ended at St. Louis. The British came and had counsel with us and he told us his people were bad children. You know, they're bad children and I'm going to spank them. The children were the colonists. The native people of the Great Lakes were not fools. It wasn't clear who the best allies would be, but it was clear that you needed European allies. Some tribes, like the Oneida, were allied with the Americans. The British tried to keep the Indians on their side by handing out presents from trinkets to weapons. It's not the case that natives were simply the cheapest mercenaries on planet Earth and you give them a few beads and they'll go die for you. Access to European trade goods and to weapons made them safer and improved their standard of living. The officials back in London were constantly complaining about how much this was costing. But if they had measured it against how much it would cost to put British soldiers in the West, which they should have done, they would have realized they were getting off very cheap. In early 1780, the British Grand Plan was in motion. By late April, they had cobbled together an attack force of 1,000. A handful were British officers. A few dozen were Canadian traders. 950 were Native Americans from about a half dozen tribes, including some at war with each other. There were so many unknowns in 1780. They had to do something. They, they had to negotiate or fight or build relationships and do something to give themselves the best chance to have a long, healthy, happy life. That's really what the tribes were trying to do. When the Spanish took over, they organized militia in all the significant towns, including St. Louis. And all men 15 to 50 were required to be in the militia. It was not an optional situation. Even with military service mandatory, Laban knew St. Louis's militia was too small to handle a large attack. To make the few men he had more effective, Laba ordered construction of a defensive tower like those he remembered from his boyhood. The Spanish were building towers in southern Spain, on islands, and in various colonies. So from looking at those, we can get an idea of what the tower looked like. Leba wanted to build four towers, but few St. Louisans were willing to help pay for them. So they finished only one, and only because Leba paid for 40% of the construction cost himself. They built it on land neighboring what today is Bush Stadium. The tower was built in an ideal location. It was built on a ridge line which commanded both the east and the west. Even if you were standing at the base of the tower, you would have been higher than the surrounding ground. The tower was made from local limestone and stood roughly three stories tall and 30 feet wide. They named it Fort San Carlos and built it in just 39 days. When it was finished, Leyva's men fetched five cannon from a dilapidated fort upriver and hoisted them to the top of the tower. I discovered a document that I have not seen published before. The men who helped build the tower, they signed a petition because they wanted to get paid for what they had done prior to the battle. And all of their names are signed on that. And I think that that's exciting because those are the people who lived this experience. Even with Fort San Carlos topped with cannon, Leba thought St. Louis still needed more protection. So he ordered construction of a long defensive barrier known as an entrenchment. Those trenches became very important when it came to defending the town. 
Unlike typical military trenches, entrenchments are protected by a wall made of dirt displaced from digging out the ditch in front of it. The entrenchment at St. Louis was a remarkable 2,000 yards long. Well, an approaching enemy would have to go down into the ditch where the dirt was dug out, then come up the wall, which was at an angle, and be faced with defenders defending soldiers right there at the wall. Even with all the building and digging, St. Louis was still protected by only 250 men. Leba was sure he needed more. And eventually, he found them in another Spanish-controlled village full of culturally French people, just 60 miles down the Mississippi. In the Battle of St. Louis, St. Genevieve arguably had a key role, largely in the sense that, that Leyva did not have enough men to cover his entrenchments. Within 24 hours of Leyva's request, 60 men, many of them trained boatmen and hunters, left St. Genevieve with all the firepower they could carry. They were probably the best soldiers. They had skills, they knew how to shoot, they had been trained. We like to say that they saved the future of the United States. As the reinforcements headed up the river, the British-led attack force continued down the river. On May 24th, two days before the battle, the attackers made camp where the Illinois River meets the Mississippi, about 40 miles north of St. Louis. The attack was planned based on the premise that St. Louis was totally undefended. In fact, uh, the British Lieutenant Governor said St. Louis was going to be easier to capture than to hold later, evidencing how easy he thought it was going to be to capture St. Louis. The British had no idea just how wrong they were. On the eve of the battle, St. Louisans were still short of bread. But thanks to the foresight of Fernando de Leyva, they had plenty of protection. St. Louis had only one church, and it was Catholic. And one of the most important holidays was the Feast of Corpus Christi, always celebrated on the Thursday following Trinity Sunday. In the spring of 1780, that Thursday fell on May 25th, the day before the attack on St. Louis. With a holiday celebration planned for the village that afternoon, a lot of St. Louisans spent the morning picking wildflowers and strawberries in the fields on the edge of town. They had no idea, just out of sight. Indian scouts were lurking in the woods. They had been sent by the British to see if St. Louis was as vulnerable as they anticipated. But what they had not anticipated was people in the fields blocking their view. The scouts never saw the entrenchments. And from that distance, if they saw the tower, they may have mistaken it for a windmill. Meanwhile, Leva had scouts of his own patrolling the river, watching for signs the attack force was on its way. They did take a lot of effort to try to see exactly when the attackers were coming, but for some reason it didn't work because when the attack came, it was a little bit of a surprise. Friday, May 26th, 1780, dawned like any other spring day. Despite the belief the town would soon come under attack, life went on as normal. Field workers were out tending to the corn crop. Businesses were open. Fernando de Leyva was in court, presiding over routine disputes. It seems almost unbelievable now reading the records of how much warning they had and how little prepared they were. I think that they had this sense of false complacency. They thought that they could handle anything with diplomacy and with gifts and with their stellar Indian relations. And the Battle of St. Louis was the end of their complacency. As noon approached, a few workers remained in the fields, but most St. Louisans headed home for lunch. For some, it would be their last meal. According to the records, the attack appeared to happen around 1 p.m.
St. Louis quickly came under a shower of bullets and arrows. Soldiers went running for the entrenchments and climbed to the top of the tower. More than 700 attackers came rushing out of the woods, like madmen, as Leva would later report, with unbelievable boldness and fury. Though on the day of the battle, Leva was terribly sick, he insisted on commanding the defense himself. But he was so weak, he had to be carried to the top of Fort San Carlos. He took an oath, and that oath said that he would defend the settlements and the possessions of the king to the death. He knew that he might die in this battle. He had to go anyway. He had to go. Madame Gauch was a uh, French lady who lived in St. Louis at the time of the attack. At the sound of the alarm, she grabbed her husband's militia coat, threw it on, grabbed a pistol in one hand and a knife in another, and ran to the gate, uh, urging the men on. The field workers got the worst of it. Some were captured, many were killed. One of the attackers came running toward an enslaved man named Lewis, whose quick thinking saved his life. Lewis smartly thought, the only way I'm gonna save myself is to throw myself to the ground right in front of him, make him trip, and hopefully win the struggle. And Lewis actually was successful, and he won the struggle, and he was able to take the musket, touting it as a trophy uh, as he made it into town. You do have blacks who are taking up arms. They're being attacked. It doesn't matter if they say, I'm not French. <laughs> Regardless of how they call themselves, they need to protect this area because this is in many ways the only home they know. And that's free and enslaved blacks. Other St. Louisans had narrow escapes. Five people in a horse-drawn cart dashed into town while coming under heavy enemy fire. Remarkably, only one of them was killed. Moments after they made it to safety, the horses, which had been hit dozens of times, collapsed and died. Just as the attack began, a farmer named Francois Hébert was out hunting. He caught a bullet in his thigh, but managed to avoid being hit again by hiding in a sinkhole. When he thought the danger had passed, Hébert fired his musket in the air, hoping someone would hear it and rush to his aid. But they did not because they could not. Even though Leyva's men heard the distant, heartbreaking screams from people being shot and mutilated, he refused to allow anyone to leave the protected part of town, suspecting those tortured cries were an instrument of psychological warfare. He was afraid of an ambush. That was a tactic that the Indians used. They would draw the people out of the forts, and then they would massacre them in open field. As a military tactic, the tribes were trying to answer the British call to cause casualties amongst British enemies, which they did. They were simply being strategic. I wouldn't call it humane, but it was strategic. At the start of the battle, the attackers took St. Louis by surprise. But as the battle unfolded, St. Louis had a surprise for the attackers. I personally think the cannon played an enormous part in the ability of the St. Louisans to win the battle. Yeah, because cannon is pretty scary. Do I really want to run down this hill and go run to that? <laughs> Bad idea. One of the popular stories relates that the Indians referred to the tower later on as the high-fenced House of Thunder and the fact that they attached thunder to it would give you some idea of how important it was in terms of psychology. At first, when they were thinking, oh, there's a thousand of us and just a handful of them, okay, we'll take a shot at that for you. But once it became clear that they were dealing with a very different situation, then it was a different kind of battle. And so they just didn't want to fight that one. Two hours after it began, the attackers retreated. The Battle of St. Louis was over. Meanwhile, across the river, a smaller group sent by the British to attack Cahokia also got a surprise. Like St. Louis, Cahokia had been hearing rumors it was going to be attacked by the British. 
But unlike St. Louis, Cahokia had only 100 soldiers, including a handful of Kaskaskia Indians who were allies of the Americans. Local leaders immediately sent letters to George Rogers Clark, who had since moved away, telling him they were under the dread of an immediate attack, begging him to come to their aid. And he did, bringing with him at least 150 men and perhaps as many as 300. As the attackers approached, the defenders gathered behind a fence surrounding part of an old French mission. But soon after the battle began, the attacking Indians realized one of the men behind the fence was George Rogers Clark, the other tiger in the woods, and that was the end of it. They retreated. There wasn't much of a battle here at Cahokia at all. They gave a few volleys for 20 minutes and said, you know what, guys, this isn't easy picking. Let's go home. Despite that swift resolution, four defenders of Cahokia were killed and five were captured. The Battle of St. Louis and the attack on Cahokia ended quickly, but not quietly. As the attackers retreated, they set crops on fire and killed livestock. Oh, it was awful. They're in a real sense of crisis, and they fear that there's another, even bigger attack coming at any time. Several days after the attack, Fernando de Leyva thought it was finally safe for St. Louisans to go into the fields to recover the dead. They found Francois Hébert in the sinkhole where he had been hiding, waiting for help. He bled to death. The people out in the fields, for the most part, their bodies were decomposed, or in a few cases they had been decapitated or otherwise uh, cut up, and they were just basically buried where they were found. In all fairness, that is exactly how Europeans did things too. When they were dealing with Indians, they routinely killed men, women, and children. None of it was pretty. In all, 21 St. Louisans were killed. Another 25 were captured. In just one afternoon, St. Louis lost 7% of its population. At other points along the Mississippi just before and after the battle, 46 people had been taken prisoner, including the husband and son of Magdalene Honoré, captured while she was away, warning St. Louis about the attack. According to British records, the number of Indians killed was four. To make sure St. Louis was not attacked a second time, 350 men from St. Louis and Cahokia were sent north to seek revenge. The first Indian village they came to was Sakanak, located in what today is Rock Island, Illinois. The Sak Indians who lived there had vacated it, but the soldiers set the village on fire anyway, leaving behind a threatening note warning they could expect more of the same if St. Louis was ever attacked again. A few months later, the Sak Indians, along with members of the Fox tribe, came back to St. Louis in peace, exchanging their British flags and medals for Spanish flags and medals. St. Louis was never attacked again. Despite Fernando de Leyva's dogged determination to defend St. Louis, the determination of his detractors robbed him of attaining the legacy of a war hero. There were letters, there were accounts that he spiked his own cannons, that he fired on his own men. Uh, they're, from my perspective, rather incredible stories and very difficult to believe. I think the people who were most vocal were the ones who disliked him most. Maybe the people who liked him weren't vocal about it because they didn't have anyone to tell. I don't think people saw him as the idea man or the force that won the battle. I think they thought they did it on their own. But in actuality, I don't think the people of St. Louis would have been motivated to dig a mile and a half of trenches or to build a 30-foot tall tower and put cannons in it. So if Deleba hadn't done that, I'm not, I, I just don't think they could have won the battle. for Leva saying, you know what? I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna defend this place. That, 
took some chutzpah. It took several months for news of Leyva's successful defense of St. Louis to reach the royal palace in Spain. But when it did, King Carlos III issued an order promoting him to lieutenant colonel, something Leyva had been requesting even before the battle. But by the time the paperwork reached St. Louis, it was too late. On June 28, 1780, just a few weeks after the Battle of St. Louis, Fernando de Leyva died. He was just 45 years old and destitute. They buried him in the floor of St. Louis's log church, not far from what today is called the Basilica of St. Louis, King of France. His grave has never been found. He's a hero. I don't think it. I know it. He was a man in a desperate situation, knew that he wasn't going to get the aid that he needed, took it upon himself to go into debt. Then when the, the attack happens, he's you know basically carried out there to lead the defense. He's near death, and he did it to the end. There's no thinking about that. He's a hero. Twenty years after the Battle of St. Louis, Spain made a deal to return ownership of the Louisiana Territory back to France. Just three years after that, France sold Louisiana to President Thomas Jefferson, instantly doubling the size of the United States. Well, if the British had been successful in their capture of St. Louis and Cahokia, they likely would have retained that territory and that probably would have prohibited not only the Louisiana Purchase, but westward expansion. Had St. Louis fallen, had Cahokia fallen, then Kaskaskia would have fallen. Not only would the British then have control of the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi and the Missouri and the Mississippi River, they would take it all the way to New Orleans. The really intriguing thing I think that we can ask ourselves is, what would have been the situation for Native American peoples had this not happened? The land that the Indians had fought so very hard to retain for themselves was surrendered to the Americans, their enemies. So nothing was settled at the end. It doesn't matter who won in the long run. That Revolutionary War is just one little episode of this major invasion that's still going on. Any time that you're going, what if, or gee, here's what I think, it's dangerous ground to go plowing in, but clearly it would have been very different and it would not have turned out in a way that Americans of today would recognize what they would see. It's amazing what little things can do or the effect they have. And St. Louis is one of those. I mean, you know, it's kind of like the rock uh, thrown into the pond and the concentric circles just keep going out and out. The Battle of St. Louis is starting to get more recognition in St. Louis. Jean-Marie Cardinal, Ignacio La Rosa, Amable Guillon, Pierre de Chetra. To mark the anniversary of the battle, a ceremony is held every year at the Missouri History Museum, honoring the 21 who died defending St. Louis. Some are still known to history only by the names of the people who bought them. A slave of Louis Chancellor. The anniversary of the battle is marked with gunfire and cannon fire at Gateway Arch National Park, the same land where some of the entrenchments were built. An exhibit about the battle has been added to the park's museum. If anything is left of Fort San Carlos, it has never been found. After the Revolutionary War, St. Louis turned it into the city jail. 
Years later, a postcard appeared featuring a stone tower photographed in St. Louis captioned Spanish Fort. But it turned out the picture had been taken long after Fort San Carlos had been demolished. The tower in the photograph really was just an old windmill. In 2018, Steve Kling, the boy who built forts out of sand while other kids built castles, turned his exhaustive research about the battle into a book, co-authored with Christine Shostrom. Thank you. They worked on it together for four years, but it wasn't until two years after the book was published. Welcome to St. Louis. That they finally met for the first time in person. How are you? Oh, it's great to see you. During Shostrom's visit to St. Louis, she was awarded the Daughters of Liberty Medal, given to her by the Fernando de Leyba chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution in recognition of her research. Largely because of the research done by Shostrom and Kling, a plaque honoring Fernando de Leyva as the defender of St. Louis was unveiled in 2019 at an elaborate military ceremony in Leyva's hometown of Sota. It was solemn, it was serious, and it was very moving. We recovered a forgotten hero. The honors for George Rogers Clark began long ago. In Vincennes, Indiana, the federal government established George Rogers Clark National Historical Park in 1931 at the site of an old British fort captured by Clark. In 2017, the federal government honored Clark again by engraving his image on almost 400 million commemorative quarters. Ironically, Clark died penniless. He was broke, he was destitute. Then he went through a series of strokes, fell on fire, burnt severely, a leg that had to then be amputated. He was a tough old coot. In the end, George Rogers Clark, the man who wanted to stand out from his older brother, was overshadowed by his younger brother instead. William Clark, along with Meriwether Lewis, led the famed expedition that explored the West. George had been offered the job first, but was too sick to take it. Through the years, St. Louis has tried to bring the battle to the public's attention. The 1904 St. Louis World's Fair commemorated the battle with a daily reenactment. In 1914, the city's 150th anniversary was celebrated with an oversized pageant that included an undersized replica of Fort San Carlos. In the 1960s, St. Louis Mayor Alfonso Juan Cervantes pushed the city to buy the Spanish pavilion and a replica of Christopher Columbus's ship, the Santa Maria, from the New York World's Fair. The mayor wanted to remind people living in a town named for a French king that for 40 years, it was a colony of Spain. But a month after opening, a thunderstorm sank the boat. A year later, bankruptcy sank the pavilion. Where the Spanish pavilion once stood, today the story of the Battle of St. Louis is summed up in 50 words on a granite marker that hardly anyone stops to read. As for those who died in the fields of St. Louis on May 26, 1780, the only stone marking their final resting place is made of concrete. Many of their individual stories are still as unknown as the exact locations of their graves. For more than two centuries, the history of the Battle of St. Louis has flashed and faded, flashed and faded. The battle has been forgotten, some believe, because there are few reminders left for people to see. Except, of course, on the 4th of July. Though they may not remember the battle itself, every year, St. Louisans love celebrating the liberty and freedom it helps secure by filling the night sky above the Mississippi River with light and thunder. 
I'm a history buff, so I understand sometimes talking to people and you say, let me tell you about an event that happened 240 years ago, their eyes glaze over and they don't want to talk about it as if, you know, 10 days ago is ancient history. I hope there's some kind of concerted effort to bring a little attention to this. It deserves more, it should get more, and I hope it does. All we have to do is turn the news on any day and talk about caravans and immigrants and migration. Our independence was achieved with the help of many people of different colors and religions. Without them, we would not have become independent in that revolution. That's why it's important. We are who we are, a many faceted people from the very beginning. Jean Marie Cardinal, Pedro de Hetra, a slave of Louis Chancellor, Carlos Bizet, a slave of Pierre Picot de Balestre, Ignacio La Rosa, Devon Kerr, Pierre de Chetra. Ajimun mahe ni menu ta ne ke chia se mi ekwa akuyo ne wagin ne pana pama wa shipai inu ke ni ne wa. Kush kush kwai mahi oi anemi ham Mashena we the mawake Ajimon mawetch nenu sheyan Ehakadaman iwi jihage